everybody, and welcome to the first ever Riverside Podcast. You guys who are listening today are our guinea pigs. Uh, we hope that, uh, that you'll watch. We hope that you'll engage with us over the next five weeks as we are going to be following up our Sunday morning uh, series that's called Generations. We're going to be following up every week uh, with interviews in which we're going to be interviewing some guests who fit into each of those generations. And so today, it's a privilege to have Don Butler and Bob Roach with us, who are part of the silent generation. I'll let them tell you if they want to tell you uh, how young they are uh, today. Um, But uh, we're just going to be talking to them about the silent generation, what it was like to grow up in the time that they grew up in, and talking about faith, the faith of the silent generation. That's, of course, what um, Sunday's message was all about, faith through adversity. If you don't know anything about the silent generation, let me just give you just a a few highlights. Uh, The silent generation is those who grew up between, or were born, actually, between 1925 and 1945. Some experts say between 1928 and 1945, but in that time range, if you know anything about world history in that time frame, um, those who were born in that time frame lived during the Great Depression or the years immediately following the Great Depression. They uh, were born during or lived during World War II. Um, they also lived through the beginning of the Cold War, McCarthyism of the 50s, and all that that meant and the advent of the civil rights movement. In fact, it was the silent generation who finally stood up for equal rights for African Americans. And uh, it was mostly the silent generation who were the leaders of the civil rights movement. For example, Martin Luther King Jr. was a a part of the silent generation born during that time. And uh, so that generation grew up during times of great adversity And yet what history tells us is the silent generation went on to be probably the most successful generation financially, um, spiritually, um, and in a lot of other ways. And uh, so we're going to talk about today kind of what it was like to grow up in that time frame and uh, let you guys share kind of whatever's on your heart, your life experiences, and whatever you want the next generation to know too. So... Now, I know you guys were both kind of born on the at the end of the silent generation. Um, silent generation, again, the last of the silent generation were born in 1945. If you're born in 1946 or uh, 1946 to 1964, I think you're a baby boomer. Um, but, you know, being born on the kind of toward the end of that, um, do you guys, do you feel feel like a silent generation or, or do you feel a little more like a, a baby boomer? Well, I, I align myself with the baby boomers because by the time I knew what life was and playing with other kids and all like that, they were the, the baby boomers were there and were beginning to, uh, every other house, there was a kid around. We never had any problem waiting for find somebody to play with. Once we got into six, seven years old, and you'd play with the kids on your street the next one week, and then the next week you'd play with the kids on another street. It was always somebody doing something yeah. like that. But, I mean, back then, I was going to tell you, the, it, was, it was back in the old days, so it was terrible winters back then, had s- terrible snowstorms and feet of snow and cold winters, and we had to get out, and Bob and I had to get out there and trudge through that stuff to get to school because they didn't close schools. <laughs> Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Uphill both ways, right? They were stories I heard from people older than I am. <laughs> yeah, that's right. How about you, Bob? How do you? How do you well, I identify the same way. I'm 83 years old, and uh, I grew up in a neighborhood like he did. We used to run through the neighborhood barefooted, never wore shoes, kids up and down the street. Some days we'd leave the house, you know, before lunch and show up for dinner time at night and always felt safe. And yeah. A lot of unlike today. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, when the silent generation started, almost no Americans, especially Americans in the cities, owned cars. Um, people that lived on farms might own a truck that they used for the farm, but it was really in the 40s after 
World War II that cars became a big thing in America, and everybody then owned a car, which led to the advent of classic cars. Um, what was what's your favorite car from that generation, and did you own it, or what was your favorite car that you owned in those early days? Later down the year, I did own one of them, and I always liked it. And when I got old enough to buy one, the first car I ever had was a 56 Chevrolet 210 Delray Coupe. Right. Delray <laughs> Coupe adds something to that. It was turquoise and white, and it had turquoise and white leather interior, which was a special ordered thing. And I have seen one listed in Hemmings Motor News recently for $65,000 oh, wow. up wow. In, in northeast somewhere like that. Yeah. Love to have it back. Oh yeah, but it so. was it was an unusual car, and it's, it's a valuable car, really. Yeah. How about you, Bob? My dad never owned a car till I was like 15 years old, so uh, I really never owned a car till after I went in the Air Force, and a couple of buddies and I went together and bought an old car just to get around down in Texas. Oh wow. And so uh, I never really bought another car, probably if another uh, five or six years after I got out. Oh, yeah. And what did, where'd you serve and when? I went to uh, Texas for Air Force for a year, and I spent a couple of years in England and then finished up in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, wow. And what years was that? I was 62 to 66. Okay, so you were after Korea and before Getting Vietnam. out of uh, right when Vietnam was heated up and everything, I was getting out, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I read an interesting thing um, just a couple of weeks ago that almost all the soldiers who served in Korea were from the silent generation. Uh, most of the World War II vets were too old to serve by that point, so it was the silent generation that served in, in Korea, which is another... <laughs> big thing that the those in that generation um, had to go through um, well tell me a little bit about what childhood was like for you like what were your parents like were your parents World War II vets either of you um, were you know did mom have to go to work because dad was serving uh, what, what was it like well my dad worked for the railroad and my mom stayed home and I had a brother and a sister and took care of us and uh you know, we just, uh, we didn't have a car. We went to the grocery store. We'd take a little red wagon and walk downtown to the grocery store and pull the groceries back. And uh, grew up in church. Uh, they were both teachers in uh, Sunday school. And uh, if the church doors were open Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday, we were there. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way we were brought up. And I was about 15 years old when I accepted Christ. Oh, wow. And, uh, Finished high school. Uh, how far you want to go? Uh, oh, keep going. Yeah, yes. Finished high school in 1959 and decided I was going to college. Went to Virginia Tech a year and a half and realized that was not my thing. And that's when I joined the Air Force and uh, spent four years there. Wow, cool. I'm sort of like Bob. Uh, my dad worked at the N&W. And four or five guys that worked in the same area rode together. We did have a car, but that car moved for it. My mother did not drive, so that car stayed in the garage until they went to the grocery store on Thursday night. And then on Sunday, we might go to a shop. They'd take, he'd take her shopping something. So, and then they would go to church with it on Sunday. And so maybe three days, the rest of the time, that car sat in the garage. It didn't oh, go anywhere. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, cool. So pretty much both of you have been in church your whole life, just about. I have. Yeah. Uh, unusual situation about that. When I was about 10, I'll, you know, I'll talk about all these baby boomers out then. My parents belonged to a church, uh, a, a Methodist church that was three or four miles away. And in the, our neighborhood, there was a church. And all the kids I went to elementary school with went there. And I told him one time, I said, you know, how about let me come and let me go with them. I, I'm, I know these kids. I don't know the kids up there where you go to church. And they said, all right, go there. So from early on until I got married, I went to that same church, and they went to their church. Oh, yeah. I would go to special events with them that they had, but otherwise I was independent at that 
at that church at all that time. Oh, yeah. And uh, one interesting thing about that I thought about, we talked about doing this. At the church that I went to, the church had a big steeple on it, and it had a, a church bell on it. I can remember going in the church on Sunday morning at the appointed time. The guy came out and rang the church bell. Oh, yeah. Hmm. It went on like that. I was in that church for quite a while, but when I got married and tr switched to the church my wife belonged to, they also had a church bill, but it was recorded church bill on an amplifier. Oh, yeah. And this is in the in the 70s. Yeah. And I can remember going to church, and they would play that thing on Sunday morning. And then I remember one Sunday, I specifically remember the Sunday morning, a police officer come in the back door you're getting complaints because a lot of apartment buildings around here and these people do not want to hear that on Sunday morning <laughs> wow. and they shut us down. So that has, that has, has way things have evolved oh, yeah. in the church world. But in, even the people around the church, the, the local church that I went to when I was young, even the people there observed that didn't go to church observed that they didn't get out and work a lot on Sunday. They, they, you know, they, they kept themselves, kept quiet. It was a day of rest of which disappeared as time went on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, some of the statistics I read are that of folks that were born in the silent generation, around 80% of, of those, um, of silent generationers, attend church and attended church all along. And in that generation, the church was kind of the center of the community. And sometimes it literally was the center of the community. You, Whatever neighborhood your church was in is where you went to church. And uh, in the youngest generation, that statistic is flipped on its head. Instead of 80% church attendance, it's now 20% church attendance in that, in that youngest generation. So there's a, there's a big change that's happened. Uh, but a lot of it was built around community, community coming together, and the church kind of calling people to to the church. Um, what about you, Bob? Well, I was raised in Benton, Virginia, and we always went to Benton Baptist Church up till I was about uh, a junior in high school. And my parents and four or five other couples left the church and started Lynn Haven Baptist Church in Benton. So I went there, I guess, while, when I was in on college and, uh, and when I joined the Air Force, unfortunately, for about 10 years, I just kind of backed away from church. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just didn't attend. Even when I was in England, I maybe went twice. I remember when I was in San Angelo, Texas, and uh, going to school down there. Me and my two friends who had bought the uh, car, we went out to get a haircut right outside the base and this barber in there came up to us, and he says, uh, you boys go to church? Well, we did back home. He said, you be out here at 9 o'clock Sunday morning. I'm going to pick you guys up and take you to church. So he got us started in uh, church for that year I was down there. Oh, wow. Well, that's awesome. And that was his way of, I guess, witnessing and the uh, opportunity to reach out to people. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um. Well, if you had any advice that you could give to the younger generations, what, what do you think it would be? Like, what's the number one thing you would say? There may have been a Big Bang Theory, but God created it. That's it. Yeah. Good. I guess for me, having fallen out of church for a number of years, I would encourage them to stay in church, to stay close to God, and... Uh, just not let everything you know that you believed in kind of go away for a few years as you find in your own way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm reminded of Psalm 145 says that one generation commends your works to another generation. That, you know, one of our, our jobs in whatever generation we're in is to make sure that we tell the next generation. And maybe that's something that we've, at least my generation, has not done a good job of sharing with the generation below us which is why church attendance statistics continue to go down. You know, as you're talking about doing this and, and uh, in your new series, you go start in generations, you're talking about tying the music into your sermons on these different generations. Mm -hmm. So use Love Lifted Me. Oh, okay. I, when we start 
when I started thinking back on this thing, that was the first song that came to me. And I remember that thing week after week after week. Oh, yeah. We'll have to pull that out. Yeah. <laughs> we. Uh, it's interesting. The songs that, that we're doing uh, for the first Sunday, we, we made sure we picked songs that were written between 1925 and 1945. Um, and I, I have to look at Love Lifted Me. I'm not sure when it was written, but we'll definitely do it some at some point during the series. Oh, yeah, it's been been really good. It's been fun, actually. Um, a song maybe you guys know from growing up we're going to sing Sunday is um, Surely Goodness and Mercy. Follow me yeah. all the days of my yeah. life. Yeah, right. we're going to yeah. sing that song. It's great, great. The words of that song are fantastic. And uh, and that's, you know, one of the things I, I hope we'll get out of this series is that um, – I think a church that is successful is a church that ministers to, to all generations. The best church is a church that's multi-generational because the older learn from the younger, the younger learn from the older, and uh, we help each other out. We, we help each other to grow in our, in our relationship with Christ. You know, just something, you're talking about doing these things like it, and, and Bob and I, I'm sure we're all on the same line with this, thinking about things that we did back then. Mm-hmm. And I bet you did it that if you wanted to go, I mean, back then, a drink cost seven cents. Mm-hmm. Moon pie cost a nickel. Right. So if we were out and didn't have any money like that, let's go to the river. We went to the river and searched pop bottles. The stores would pay two cents a bottle. Yep, I remember taking caps. So down. we would go down there and collect enough pop bottles. We'd all go up yeah. there and have moon pies and Pepsis. Yeah, we had R.C. Cola. R.C. Cola, yeah. right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you could do something with the caps, too, at one point, right? <clears throat> Some of them, they would take oh, yeah. caps one time for something. I don't know what it was. I don't remember. I, I never got into caps. Mm-hmm. It was always bottles. Yeah. Well, I did that myself in the 80s. We would, I'd still, walk along the river. They were still the paying that oh, then? Oh, yeah, yeah. You could, you could get 10 cent back then. Man, I'd, I'd take my bottles down, and, and the guy that owned the Dilly Dally would, would take them. And, you know, you you turn in 10 bottles and a dollar gets yeah, you a Yeah, but how, much, how much were drinks then? What were they? Probably twenty five cent. Probably yeah. twenty five to thirty five cent. Probably for a bottle of RC. <laughs> there was a drink then called. I'm, I'm sure you remember Grey Pet. Yeah. It was a I seven that, seven yeah. ounce bottle. It was the best drink in the world. I yeah. thought. Huh. You remember that? I remember that. We used to go over in the park and play, and come back over to the little store, and we'd get hot and tired and grab those drinks. <laughs> yeah. And where'd you do most of your shopping growing up? Well, for me, being in Vinton, it was a very small town. I think he had like one grocery store and one little department store, so it was pretty much the same thing yeah. all the time. And uh, we'd go to Roanoke occasionally, take the bus. But. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, in Salem, uh, there was that was the early days of the Kroger. My, my parents went to Kroger. Yeah. Early on, like that, they did the shopping. I didn't do that. They brought the phone food home ate it <laughs> that's right <laughs> well i remember the green market and uh yeah, ben franklin five and dime on main street still yeah. when i was little one other thing and and you remember this too and thinking about that time like that television at night went off at 12 o'clock at night oh, yeah. it came back on early in the next morning what they called a test pattern and that test pattern Stayed on until the new early morning news come on, and then they come on and they did the, I believe they did the national anthem before they ever started the program, didn't they? We didn't have a TV probably until I was thirteen or fourteen. I was ten. Years old. I was ten. <laughs> we got what? Yeah, I, right. I used yeah. to lay on the floor and listen to ball games on a great big old radio, radio. we had oh. in there by the potbelly stove. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's you know the um, when you look up Silent Generation. The silent generations often also called the radio generation because there were there wasn't TV for most people, so it was families gathered around the radio listening to the radio shows, whatever. And the radio that we had, my dad had bought this thing. I mean, that was the only thing. No televisions around, but this was a big cabinet, and this thing stood four foot high and had this radio stuck in the thing like that. Yeah. And uh, we just listened to radio at night. Same for me. Till I was up to ten years. Till I was ten years old when they bought the television. My dad was a Red Sox fan, so I always followed that. And I remember laying down the floor, <laughs> listening to those ball games at night. That's the way you entertained yourself. And what was your favorite radio show? Probably, uh, oh, what was the uh, Lone Ranger one? Different things like that. Yeah. yeah. 
I didn't listen to that. I was waiting on television. <laughs> <laughs> Remember funny. the first color TV came in the neighborhood, and yeah. I had to run down my friend's house to watch the uh, football game and see it in color. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was mid '60s, or probably. Probably they had a thing they put over the screen to give it to color, some kind of mm-hmm. oh, plastic really? thing. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Uh-huh. So, what about movies? Did uh, did you go to movies ever when you were a kid? <clears throat> yeah, I used to. Then when I was a teenager, we used to catch a bus, go up to Roanoke, the old Rial, Rialto and the American Theater and watch movies. Uh-huh. Yeah. They had, uh, in Salem, if you were a patrol boy, you worked the corners, you know, and watched the kids across the street like that, there was two places. There was the uh, Colonial Theater in Salem that used to give to the patrol boys, they would give you free tickets. So I can remember having those free tickets and going on Saturday afternoon watching the matinee at uh, Colonial Theater in Salem. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, I used to have a paper route, 100 papers. I took around on my bicycle, so that's the way I earned my spending money. Uh, tell them, Bob, how much you earned for carrying them papers for one week. It wasn't a lot. <laughs> I, figured, I can't remember I, I how much back it was. My, <laughs> I didn't have a big paper route, but I had 50 papers and eight dollars a week that sounds about, that's about right. like a dollar a day yeah. it's all he got i'd have some money. i'd have to make uh half the route come back and pick the rest of the papers up and start out again <laughs> oh yeah all right i'm gonna i'm gonna quiz you a little bit see uh see what you remember from growing up I, any idea um what the let's say you guys were on the young side but 1955 number one movie Number one movie in 55? Uh-huh. Good day. I'll give you a hint. It was an animated movie. Snow White? No. Lady and the Tramp. Um, 1960 was another Disney movie. It was a movie, not a not a cartoon. Swiss Family Robinson. Animated? Yeah, oh, Swiss oh, Family okay. Robinson. Yeah, I don't know. Number two in 1960 was Psycho. And then Spartacus and the Exodus. Let's see. Um, how about, let's talk about cars. All right, let's go there. All right. Uh, any idea, this is going back, number one selling car of 1952? Uh, it was a car. Mm-hmm. It was probably Ford. Nope. Chevrolet. Nope. Buick. <laughs> Buick? Okay. Yeah, the Buick Roadmaster. <clears throat> now, if kids are watching this podcast and they've seen the Cars movie, they might know the next one. Number one selling car of 1953. Hudson. Hornet. Hornet. Yep, I'll fast forward a little bit. Uh, Ford, 1957, was a Ford it was the most popular? Uh-huh. 157 Chevrolet. Yep, it was the Ford Skyline was the number one selling car. 57. That's 57. The Skyliner was, oh, okay, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yep, 56 was the Chevy Corvette. And 58 was the Ford Thunderbird. And 1960 was the Rambler Ambassador. I don't even know what any of these were. I, I had an uncle that had <laughs> a Rambler Ambassador. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. But I sort of uh, like that Corvette in 56, so. Yeah. Let's see. Number, one of the number one songs in 1955. Rock Around the Clock. Yep. That was it. Let's see. Bill Haley and the Comets. Yep. And then number three that year was The Yellow Rose of Texas. And number five was Unchained Melody. Um, 1960, any idea? I think it was an Elvis song. Jailhouse Rock. No. Are You Lonesome Tonight? Isn't that Elvis? That I Elvis think song? so. Yeah. And then The Twist came out that year. And yeah. Hallie, you Shall remember checker? that? Yeah. 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 Well, cool. Well, anything else you guys want to talk about today? or <clears throat> Any advice you want to give a, a Gen X pastor? <laughs> <laughs> It, or it a millennial guy behind the scenes. The millennial guy, yeah. <laughs> we need to talk to him. Then, huh? Yeah, that's right. 
<laughs> it was a, it was an interesting time like that. I mean, we did. I, I was ten years old. I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. But uh, and they talk about the baby boomer generation, and I'm glad it was at at that time because I've got I had so many friends over the years that uh, come out of that time, and it was like I said while ago that there, there was just so many kids on every street. There was kids and. You'd play with one group one week, and the next week you were down at the other end of the street with somebody else. Yeah. And so, I mean, I was the only child, so I had no one in, in my household to play with. Mm -hmm. But I, I never felt lonely. I felt like, you know, I could go up two doors, and there's two guys, two kids up there. It's a girl and a boy up there. and go across the streets, three of them over there. Yeah. So I never felt lonely or, mm -hmm. you know, without someone to be with. Yeah, I didn't either. And uh, you can, parents never worried about you. You could be out all day, go down to school, play baseball and everything. They just knew you was okay, and you'd come home <laughs> when you was hungry, you know? Yeah. The only thing back then, though, the thing that I, I – kids are so fortunate they'd have little ballparks. Like you got these mm -hmm. little league – they got lights on these things. Mm -hmm. We played in the street and in backyards back then, and it was just no place to play. It Played football in the street. Find somebody that had a garage. We'd nail an old basket. I mean, a literal basket yeah. on the front of the garage and shoot basketball. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's evolved over time like that to great. These kids have got so many opportunities to do that nowadays. Yeah. Well, my dad is a first But it was fun year. in what we did. Oh, yeah. My dad's a first-year baby, baby boomer. He was born in 46. So he's kind of he's the opposite of you guys. Like, to me, he's more a little more like the silent generation than a, than a baby boomer. But – but he used to talk about when he was growing up, they if it snowed, that the city would come and shut down Mulberry so the kids could sleigh ride on Mulberry Avenue, um, which, you know, they'd never do that now. They're too busy no. getting everything <laughs> cleared out. So. Well, the other place was where the, uh, where the fire department is. Mm -hmm. We used to come off of that hill and come down and hit Eddie Avenue and go down the hill on Eddie Avenue down – I mean, you couldn't go all the way to Bowman Avenue, but you could get yeah. down almost to it. Yeah, I'd say you I mean, you come close. off there wide open like oh, that yeah. with them. <laughs> Good old days, yeah. What's uh, what's the favorite food you remember eating growing up? <laughs> when I got – I visited my cousin in Maryland, and when I was about 11 years old, he got his parents to go buy pizza. I had never eaten pizza in my life. Mm -hmm. My parents – my dad was big on hunting and fishing, and they just had fish and rabbit and squirrel, and I did not like it. <laughs> and the first time I ever ate pizza, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> well, we hung with hot dogs and hamburgers a lot. And every Sunday, go up to my grandmother's house, and she always had fried chicken and all the fixings and homemade pies. I always remember that. You know? Oh, yeah. Good. Well, guys, thanks a lot for, for coming on with us today and being our guinea pigs for our, our first podcast. It's been a great conversation. I kind of – I don't want to quit. Like, I'd like to keep going and keep talking about it. So, I'm, I'm going to find a Bob? reason. To, that's right. I'm going to find a reason to bring you back on. That's that's what we'll do. But uh, but thanks a lot. Really appreciate appreciate you taking the time and, and uh, appreciate your insight and your wisdom. Uh, you guys bring a lot of wisdom to the church as well and uh, always appreciate – Anything that you have to I really say. appreciate the children's program and the youth program this church has. And uh, that was so important to me growing up and having a lot of grandchildren now. Yeah. They're really involved and really enjoyed it. Well, I appreciate you bringing them. You, you brought a lot, of, a lot of folks to this church, so appreciate it. Yeah, good. Well, thanks, yeah. folks, for, for watching with us. Thanks for being with us today. Hope you have a great week. And... Uh, Remember, honor the generation before and make sure you teach the generation that's coming after. God bless you. See you soon.